should watch this at night. Hey Curious Cats, my name is Sahara. Welcome to the Trivram channel. Let's get into it. Tonight is the highly requested Jacob Matthew Morgan case, or Matt Morgan. You probably noticed that this video is shorter than usual, and it's simply because there wasn't much information out there, which can sometimes happen. Considering this case is pretty recent, I did find it surprising, but as the Americans would say, c'est la vie. They stole that one from us. In the morning of March 6, 2015, in Rock Hill, South Carolina, Mike Hill is getting ready to drive his wife, Julie Hill, to work. They have a 14-month-old baby, Joshua, and a 17-year-old son that Julie had from a previous relationship, Jacob Matthew Morgan. That morning, Mike and Julie ask Matt to babysit his brother Joshua while they're away. And because it's so early in the morning, Matt is still tired. He goes to the living room, he lies down on the sofa, and he falls asleep. Around 8.30, a strong smell of smoke inside the house wakes him up. He runs to the front door and exits the house, and then he realizes that his baby brother is still inside. Matt started to panic, he started to scream, he tried to go back inside the house. He started banging his head on the ground and said that he wanted to go back inside, but it was just so hot. Some neighbors say that he did try to go back in, but they prevented him from doing so, believing it was too dangerous and it was probably already too late for Joshua. When ambulances arrived at the scene, they try to save Joshua, but they're too late. Matt will be interrogated by police a few days later, and it was either after they had spoken to his parents or after the investigation revealed that the fire had been started in at least two different locations. At least two that they could determine, meaning there could have been more that were consumed by the blaze. In an interview Julie and Mike will later give on television, they explain that Matt has autistic tendencies. He was diagnosed by a doctor as not being severely autistic, but having autistic tendencies. Emotionally, he's about three years behind, but he has normal cognitive functions. He understands what people say to him. You just have to clarify, be very specific, and sometimes repeat yourself a few times. His mother will add that he was taught to take care of a baby and she felt like it was okay to give him this responsibility. Both parents were asked how they could be okay with living such a big responsibility on a teenager, let alone a teenager who was emotionally challenged. Mike replies that when he was about the same age, he would often take care of his siblings. To be honest, I do understand what Mike is saying because I was much younger when I would take care of my own siblings. So I get that it's possible and I get that it's okay. I do understand both sides. I do understand that the reporter thinks that it's not responsible to give the responsibility of an infant to a teenager. And Matt is slightly autistic, so does it mean that he should not have the responsibility of an infant? Does it mean that he cannot take care of a baby? I mean, considering what happened, I think we can safely say that no, he could not. Matt's parents actually support their son 100%. They do not believe that Matt is an arsonist. They believe it was an accident, a tragic accident that was not caused by Matt. Mike said, I will never get over losing my little boy. I will never get over my other son being accused of the loss of our little boy. The question of Matt being interrogated without a parent was brought up during the interview on television. Uh, they actually took us out of the room before they took him, so we did not even know at first that he was being interrogated. His mother argued that police did inform her that they could interrogate him without notifying parents, but since Matt is somewhat disabled, she felt like this should not have applied to him. The circumstances were exceptional, they were different. It was reported that Matt truly believed that these police officers would shoot him if one, he did not answer their questions, and two, if he didn't say what he thought they wanted to hear. And they seemed to have been leading him into that direction, telling him that he did it on purpose, he started the fire, his intention was to kill his brother, he left the house and he didn't try to go back inside to save him. Julie also specifies that Matt cries when you just shout at him, so she could only imagine how terrified and intimidated he must have felt being in a room with two big guys carrying guns and asking him questions for five 
hours straight. So yes, police can interrogate a minor without their parents' consent or even knowledge for that matter, especially in cases where it is believed that one of the parents is suspected of improper behavior with the said child, like sexual or physical abuse, for example. And in that same article where I found the answer to the question, can a minor be interrogated without their parents or guardian, it also said, police could make a referral to Child Protective Services if they feel you are protecting someone else and not acting in your child's best interests, which is your legal duty. Because, you know, some people, they don't know. That when you have a kid, you're supposed to protect them from harm. The police might also threaten you with criminal charges such as obstructing a police investigation or child neglect for failing to pursue criminal charges against an offender who victimized your child. So here to explain that a minor can be interrogated without a parent, they're taking the example of a parent who would be the abuser and the other parent trying to protect the abuser rather than their child. But in any given context, it is the parent's job to protect their child. So I was wondering, is it neglect on behalf of Mike and Julie that they requested from Matt that he babysits his infant brother when they knew he had learning disabilities, and emotional troubles. Mike, on the day of the fire, said to television reporters that his son had emotional issues, and Julie said on television that her son had learning disabilities. She said it doesn't mean that he can't learn, he can, but at a slower pace than other teenagers. So do these issues make him unfit to babysit. And did he babysit before? This is something that I actually found weird, is the fact that they never mentioned, at least not to my knowledge, they never mentioned if he babysat in the past or not. I think if he had, they would have mentioned it because it would have been maybe not proof, but it would have supported the fact that he did that in the past, he babysat in the past and everything went well and this was just an accident. When Matt was interrogated, as I said, he told police officers that he had been woken up by the smell of smoke and he stuck with that version for some time. Then he changed it to, I was upset with my parents for waking me up so early in the morning, so I threw a pillow toward an electrical heater. Then he changed his version again and said he took a lighter to burn off a little piece of string that was hanging out from a pillow. And the last one he came up with was he just set a pillow on fire and he just threw it into the air. He admitted to investigators that he was fascinated by fire. They didn't even ask him. He just mentioned it. He even said he set fires since he was a kid. He said he loved lighting tea candles and carrying them around the house. And that's what he did that morning. In fact, he took a candle to his brother's bedroom. He accidentally dropped it on Joshua's blanket and a small fire started. At that point, he left the bedroom. He went into the living room where another fire started with the pillow. The investigation revealed that it was not the heaters that started the fires. Even though that's what Mike and Julie claimed happened, they said they'd been having electrical problems for quite some time now, especially in the kitchen. And that's actually why they had electrical heaters inside the trailer, inside the home. Their heating system just didn't work. It had broken down and their landlord refused to do anything about it. He refused to fix anything in the house. Matt's public defender stated that the only thing that truly links him to setting the fires is his coerced confession during interrogation. He also highlighted the fact that this interrogation was not recorded no audio, no video, and this confession shouldn't even be admitted as evidence. I mean, it was, but it shouldn't have been. The accusation will argue that even though the jury could accept the fact that he was interrogated, and I quote, beyond his limited abilities to fight back, and even though he might not have wanted to kill his brother, there was no denying the evidence. He was obsessed with arson. The fire was started in two different locations near heat sources to make it look like an accident. Matt admitted to dropping a candle inside the baby's crib where the first fire was started. Then he left the bedroom without trying to extinguish it. And then he went to the living room where another fire started. The accusation just could not believe that an accidental fire was started in one room and seconds later another accidental fire would start in another room. I mean, I don't think pigs can fly, so... 
considering what we're feeding them, that might happen soon. The investigation also revealed that Matt did not use his cell phone to call 911. His phone was in his pocket and he did not call for help. It was a neighbor who did. But as I said, the family and neighbors and also other eyewitnesses, they did argue that Matt tried to go back inside and when he was prevented from doing so, he just broke down and he started to cry and scream. Which I guess makes sense, right? I can't believe that. Matt started a fire two weeks prior to the death of his stepbrother. Matt's family admitted that he liked setting small fires to, you know, leaves and such. And they argued that every child does, but it doesn't mean they want to kill someone. I think that's where they lost me because I never set fires when I was a kid. Is that what kids do? Really? Suddenly I don't feel normal. Everybody attested to Matt's love for his brother. He would always carry him. He would always play with him give him piggyback rides. Everybody said he loved him so much and it was just unthinkable that he would want to hurt him. I mean, you can still love someone and want them dead. In February 2016, about a year after the death of Joshua Hill, Matt Morgan pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter and unlawful conduct toward a child. For the arsons, he pleaded the Alfred plea, meaning that he accepts punishment, but he does not admit guilt. During the sentencing, Matt said, I love my brother, I still do to this very day. He's my best friend. To kill him would be killing part of myself. He was the only brother I ever had, and I just wish I could have gotten to him in time. Matt Morgan was sentenced to five years in prison for involuntary manslaughter, 10 years for unlawful conduct toward a child, and five years probation for arson. Both prison sentences are to be served consecutively, meaning 15 years behind bars. Matt will be released on December 14, 2022. He's actually eligible for parole since March this year, so about two months ago, meaning that he could be released soon, I guess. I mean, maybe he's actually already outside, I don't know. I did not find that information, sadly. According to his record, he's actually a good inmate. No problems whatsoever, so early release is definitely a possibility. If he violates the terms of his probation, though, he could be sent back to prison for another 15 years. Julie, his mother, maintains that she refuses to believe that her son who cries when he watches Disney movies, is a cold-blooded killer. She had even started a petition for his release. The community in Rock Hill was actually very supportive. A lot of them signed the petition. They just could not believe that Matt would be capable of such a horrible thing. The petition was started when he was arrested, but there was no follow-up. I'm assuming that the family was hoping that it would avoid him going to prison or even get all charges dropped, but that didn't happen. And prison is not where he should be, or so they think. Matt was actually attacked in prison by another inmate called Quinteris Ziquan Miller. I'm probably not saying that right. That person is the primary suspect in a deadly shooting. Quinteris punched Matt in the face, we don't know why, and he busted his lip. There's video footage of the attack, but I could not lay my hands on it. To be fair, I actually don't agree with the fact that Matt is in prison. I think he should be in a mental health institution like Isabella Guzman. As much as I am all for gender equality, women don't get the same treatment as men when it comes to crime. I mean, we're not nearly as bad as men, so maybe that's why. And that concludes what I call the TikTok famous trio. Isabella Guzman, Devin Erickson, and Matt Morgan. Now, why do I call it the trio? It's simply because there are a lot of videos videos about all three of them and also compilations of Gacha Life animations. I don't know if they're called animations. Basically, Gacha Life is a type of, you know, phone or tablet game for kids slash teenagers where you make up a character, you invent a story, and it can literally be anything. Because in the game, you have a huge variety of well, accessories and possibilities. And yes, that is a gun. So this is just me fooling around and trying to understand gacha life games. But here are some clips of what people with exceptionally disturbing imagination came up with.
I had to change the music that was actually used in those TikToks copyright issues. And just FYI, I mean, I think you can tell from what you just saw, but I found a lot of articles and videos about how gacha life can be super creepy. A lot of videos that people make or stories they come up with involve incest, pedophilia, necrophilia, murder, classic, arson as well. I mean, you name it, if it's creepy, if it's horrifying, it will be on Gacha Life. Don't get me wrong, I mean, Gacha Life has an innocent and nice side to it. Like, I'm not saying they're all bad and creepy, but sometimes that is the direction in which they tend to go. Now, in case you wonder why uh, Guzman, Erickson, and Morgan became so famous, famous on TikTok, I did mention one of the reasons in the Isabella Guzman video. It was her looks, and it was the same for Devin. A lot of people were defending them, saying that they were just too cute to be in prison. I don't know why I did that. For Matt Morgan, it's different. It, it wasn't because people thought he was super attractive. I would say that the first reason is his reaction to the sentencing and the sentence itself. Set a fire in the bedroom where the child is and then for it to sleep. A burn pattern that goes from underneath that child towards the door of the bedroom uh, that is caused by likely something. It's a significant burn pattern as he described it. It could have been alcohol, it could have been something else that gets consumed by the fire. But a significant burn pattern shows that there is something said significant uh, and intentional. And at that point, to start a fire in that room as he admits, and then to walk away, not trying to escape from that fire, and immediately starting another fire in the living room, and then to claim it's an accident that it got out of control, that's an extreme recklessness. And that's intent. That's maliciousness. That's a definition of madness. And as you walk away from a fire that you've just lit in another room with a small baby, walk into the front room, like that fire, and then leave the residence standing outside watching it burn till it becomes too much to go back to. That's malice. And so malice is here on both counts because all that murder requires is malice of poor heart and more fascination with fire to watch that burn, knowing that that child was in there that was going to die and not calling 911, not saving that child when he could have, and not having started the fires in the first place. He has to take responsibility. And so there's much more here than probable cause. So I'll ask the court to find probable cause on both charges in this case. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. The testimony from both sides. Question and testimony. I believe the state has, in fact, met with burden. So therefore, I am going to find that there is probable cause to charge the individual with the Found over four general sessions for for more charges. Death penalty for a 17-year-old. Except he was not sentenced to death, but a lot of people are saying that on social media. Not in English, granted. It's mostly French TikToks, Spanish TikToks especially for Isabella Guzman. There are just thousands of TikToks about these three killers spreading false information, mostly French and Spanish, also Portuguese, Italian, and Arabic. Other languages too, but these are like the main five. Was it five? It was five, because I can't count at night, so I have to make sure. It's five. These cases did not make the headlines outside of the US. At least I can speak for France. I know they didn't. And the reason I'm saying that is because a lot of this information is going to be available in English for English speakers, but it's not going to be available in another language. A lot of people don't speak English, so it's easy to misunderstand. And you can't always rely on Google Translate to have something that is accurate. And let's face it, I'm sure a lot of people lied on purpose. They just made the story even crazier just to have more followers. But the language barrier and the despair for online recognition, online fame, and money, I guess. I mean, let's face it, also money. They were not the only problems. They were not the only factors that contributed to the lies spreading. When a story is more sensational, it just spreads. People wanted to believe that Isabella's mother 
tried to sell her to a drug cartel. They're Latino cartel. It was an easy connection. It's believable. It's more sensational. People wanted to believe that Devin Erickson was wearing a furry costume, going to the school and trying to terrorize kids. And remember that on TikTok, a lot of users are actually kids or teenagers. They're easily impressionable. There's a lot of stuff that they don't know, like the fact that a minor cannot be sentenced to death, which is what some people thought about Matt Morgan. When I posted my video about Devin Erickson, I had a lot of people tell me that I did not mention the furry thing. And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I read a lot of articles. I watched uh, a lot of videos as well. And I never heard anyone mention furry until I went and checked on TikTok. There was this girl who has a YouTube channel called Candy Paws and she also has a TikTok account and she made this video where she filmed herself going to a furry convention. Check out this picture of Devin Erickson. He has a fake tattoo on his hand. It's like a sort of emoji, like a more evolved furry referenced emoji. And because of that, again, the connection was very easy and simple to make. You add to that the very stupid idea that someone had to make an edit of the Candy Paws video and the Devin Erickson clip where he's in his uh, jail uniform. I don't know if it's called a uniform, but you know what I mean? Someone just made that montage and ideas started, you know, blooming in people's heads and that's what happened. So kids or teenagers seeing that fake tattoo on Devin's hand and seeing the furry connection, they just believed it. It wasn't that far-fetched. There's also the age factor. These killers were 17 and 18 years old. They can relate because they're close in age and they can also relate to shared interests and also the lack of knowledge about a culture, whether it be it the American culture, the Latino culture, that just adds up and it makes people believe that kind of stuff, especially when you're a kid and you just, you know, believe some things are true when they're not. And just for fun, leave a comment and share something that you used to believe when you were a kid or teenager yourself. I'll start and read the comments if you want to make fun of me. I just want to end this video by saying that I'm not saying TikTok is bad or gacha life is bad. When it comes to TikTok, a lot of people hate it. I actually used to hate it, but I changed my mind recently. I think it's just like any other social media platform. It's how you use it. With great power comes great responsibility. Peter. TikTok can be dangerous, but TikTok can be also amazing. You just have to learn to love it or not. I mean, you can do whatever you want, I guess. And on that note, share your thoughts on TikTok. Do you use it? Do you not use it? Do you post or do you watch? Do you take or do you talk? Especially if you hate it, I really would like to know why. Because I used to hate it. And now I don't. We do have a random item review for tonight. Again, it's a book because, you know, being smart is like growing potatoes. You have to keep doing it if you want to survive. Do I have to specify when I make a stupid joke? Because sometimes they're so stupid. I feel like people don't understand them. Fluent in Three Months by Benny, Benny Lewis. I absolutely love this book. It's tips and techniques to help you learn any language. I was looking for the link on Amazon and I found out that he, first of all, he got cuter. <laughs> Can I say that? It's like he has a beard now and like he didn't when he wrote this book, I guess. And second of all, he wrote more books on like specific languages. This guy is like the typical, I don't know if it's bad to say that, but like he's the average American guy. He used to be at least the average American guy who did not speak any other languages other than English and then one day he just decided to change that and he was over 30 years old when he when he made that change so it's definitely possible I truly believe that at any time in your life you can acquire a new skill you can learn new languages you can do whatever you want I do want to mention a couple of things that maybe he does not talk about in the book I'm not sure I read it a long time ago I'm not sure that he talks about Netflix I mean he probably talks about I think he I think I remember that he talks about music and books so you know movies television and series like they all fall into that category of entertainment so I would definitely add watching content online or even YouTube videos or obviously TV shows and movies that you like or new ones that you want to discover I think it's a good exercise to also watch stuff that you know because you're 
familiar with it in one language and then when you re-watch it it makes it easier and not as overwhelming especially if you don't master the language yet and if you're a beginner I think it's easier to not be overwhelmed by so much information because you know what the characters are you know are talking about so I would definitely add Netflix to the list I mean, I am a fan of Netflix, maybe that's why I keep saying Netflix, but like any content that you love, you know, binging. And the second thing, I think he does mention that. I'm, I'm pretty sure he does. But the second thing is whatever you want to learn, you have to have passion. You have to have the will to do it and it will make things so much easier. I started learning English when I was 13, but I actually fell in love with it when I was 14. So after a year, I started learning in school and my first year, I absolutely hated it because I did not have the right teacher. The year after that I had such an amazing teacher. She believed in me so I believed in myself and I just started loving it. So ever since the age of 14 I've been you know pushing myself when it comes to English. I've been reading a lot and at first I started watching movies that I love like the Lord of the Rings that I watched so many times in English and at first I would watch with French subtitles and then when I got comfortable I would watch with English subtitles and then it's been a while now since I've watched something with subtitles I don't need them anymore not to brag but I mean yeah if you truly love something it will come you have to give it time and on that note I thank you so much for watching till the end I apologize I'm posting this on Monday I wanted to post it yesterday a few things came up uh, so I apologize and I will see you, well actually this week because I'm planning on posting this week on time. So yeah, I'll see you soon. Bye.